Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by one of the greatest minds in the sport of boxing, legendary trainer and broadcaster, Teddy Atlas. Today's episode brought to you by Athletic Greens. And rather than read the uh, notes that I made like I did in previous episodes, uh, I'm just going to tell you that this is a product that I genuinely use. Some of the comments on YouTube question the uh, authenticity of my read. Please know I wrote those notes and I was looking down to make sure I covered everything. But I use this product every single day. I travel with it extensively. I used it in my preparation for a marathon that I ran yesterday in Sacramento. And uh, for those who are doubting that the um, that we actually use these products, every product we endorse on the show is uh, products that we use and, and companies that we reached out to ourselves. So please check out Athletic Greens at athleticgreens.com. Use the promo code ATLAS for free uh, 20 free travel packs and uh, let us know what you think. Again, big fan of the product. Teddy, we got a lot to get to. Huge heavyweight tight, title fight in uh, Clash on the Dunes, the uh, rain in Riyadh. We can fill in a whole bunch of different uh, different uh, titles for this fight. What'd you think? Uh, first of all, congratulations on your race. Thank you. You did really well. We tell everybody your time. It's a marathon and you I mean, it's an incredible time. Yeah, I ran uh, 228, 539 per mile. Tremendous. And um, it was, well, what was it for? It was for California. It, I know it was in Sacramento. Yeah, it was a California International Marathon. That was uh, last year was the uh, National Championships for Marathon. And um, I came in second in Masters 40 plus, And I was first in 45 to 49 age group. I think the second fastest time in that age group ever. How many entrants do you? Uh, uh, it was uh, in in the age group. There were twenty seven hundred, twenty seven hundred over forty actually. Well, very good, tremendous. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And um, a lot better than the Patriots did. <laughs> Poor Patriots are struggling you know? right now. Hey, listen, you know it's a funny thing. I got to touch on it. Uh, last episode we did, and it was well received. We appreciate everybody. The numbers for our podcast, quite frankly, we don't talk about it but they're really doing well i mean that's why we're doing it and um we appreciate you guys uh that you appreciate what we're saying and you're there you're there with us so last week i remember i opened up by talking about another sport football and i just talked about the outrageousness of where the refereeing had gone like it was it, it got to a place where and it is at a place where you don't even know the calls that are being made. Like they, they're random calls. It's subjective to the uh, whatever the ref is feeling that day or what he ate that day. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, but it, it's just out of control. And and then with the replay and not replay and uh, what they can replay, what they can't replay. I think that really they're they're playing around with this game. I know the game because of gambling and because of the brutality of it, the toughness of it, everything else. Um, it's it's a sport that's a billion dollar business in the United States. It's worldwide now. Uh, it's growing, and you know they're moving it. The NFL is moving it internationally, and obviously it's a huge business, and it's going to be successful and going to continue to be successful. But they're not helping themselves uh, with the way the refereeing is going them, and they're opening themselves up. And I brought it up last week, and I think it's good to cross over because. I'm just thinking what you guys are thinking out there. I know you watch football, and even though you're here for the boxing, you're watching it on Sunday. You're watching it, uh, you know, maybe college football too, uh, which is, I think, in some ways uh, a more interesting sport you know, for different reasons. But the possibility of it being fixed, you know, we're always talking about the corruption, and I think it's fair, you know, I'm always on top of this sport, boxing about the corruption of it, the possibility of corruption, where corruption does lie, and putting a light on it, but somebody needs to put a, start worrying about it a little bit in football, how easy it would be to corrupt that sport, to fix a game, get a hold of a referee, throw a flag, who's going to question it? Yeah, you can't. You've, yeah, the the horse is out of the barn. You've you you've allowed yourself to get to a point where nothing could be questioned. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really could be fixed. The game could. Some I know people say, "Where that call kind Jokingly, the referee must uh, have the other side. But now you wonder, 
when it might not be a joke anymore. Mm. But the reason I brought it up was when I talked about it and opened up the show last week about it, you poo-pooed it. Yeah, no, not in a bad way, but I mean, you were like, uh, but I just wondered now that it affected your Patriots <laughs> because they destroyed you guys. The referees <laughs> destroyed the Patriots yesterday. And when nobody's out there putting a sympathy party up for somebody named Tom Brady and Belichick, I get it. I get it. And and they've gotten their calls in the past. I get that too. Uh, the softballs, all that stuff, <laughs> whatever. But I was thinking, I couldn't help but think about you yesterday <laughs> and say, I wonder if Ken has a different perspective on it now <laughs> that his Patriots got blown up by the refs. I, I, was, I was watching it from the airplane flying from uh, Sacramento last night late, and uh, I swear the people around me must have thought I was nuts because I had my headphones on, and a few times I like just blurted out some curse words, and I could see people turning around looking at me like, what the hell is wrong with this guy? When they took the two touchdowns off the board on the same drive. I was like, what game is this guy watching? And, you know, the Patriots couldn't challenge the out-of-bounds call on that one touchdown at the end. It was painful to watch. But I keep reminding myself that uh, when the when the bright, when the the bright lights are the brightest, uh, Tommy will uh, okay, that's deliver us to okay, the promised that's land. A, that's <laughs> a, I didn't want you to lead to that. That wasn't <laughs> – I just had to bring that up. But as far as the, the Ruiz, Joshua, listen, you heard it here first um, – you know, we obviously we picked. I picked uh, Joshua to win. I said that uh, redemption is more powerful than money, and it is. It's more powerful than money. You can give him all the credit in the world. Uh, there's a lot of ways we can go on this fight, though, that a lot of people probably wouldn't go. But it's more, it's more complex than it at first blush it looks. Uh, you know, but. The main thing is very like, and then when I say you heard it here first, we're not patting ourselves on the back. I'm wrong a lot of times, but I, I think I even said it would be a late round stoppage. Mm-hmm. But uh, I was, I mean, late round stoppage, unanimous decision. I just thought that he would clearly win. He would clearly win. He would redeem himself. Mm-hmm. That's the key. That he would, that he needed to redeem himself. Uh, because. You can live in a big house and uh, have all those bank accounts and cars and everything else, but how do you want to live in that house? Do you want to be uh, you want to be putting towels over mirrors <laughs> all day long so you're not seeing yourself when you walk through that big house? You know, how do you want to feel in that big house? And that's what it came down to. And very similar as we used leading up to this fight, very similar to. The Buster Douglas situation with Tyson, you know, when he pulled off that upset, which one of the biggest upsets, maybe the biggest ever in boxing, but definitely the one of the, also the biggest in sports. When Douglas stops Tyson in Tokyo, that, I mean, after that, just like Ruiz, what happens? He puts weight on. He comes in in his first defense against Holyfield, not in shape, and he gets blown out. The same, I mean, it's almost like Ruiz read that, you know, handbook on, you know, how to how to screw up a world title, you know, how to give back something that you you earned. And he did earn it. He got off the floor to win that fight against Joshua to become champion. But it's almost like he, he did. He, he went out there and said, let me... Uh, let me go on the internet and see what Buster Douglas did or everyone else did. Now, I mentioned some other guys. Uh, and I mentioned it pre, pre the fight was the Sugar Ray Leonard Duran first fight. Duran finally makes the money, just like Ruiz, finally makes the money, gets the acclaim. Listen, he was lightweight champ Duran, different, a little different, uh, great fighter, but he never got quite the acclaim he got when he fought Leonard. Or well, definitely not the money. And now he gets paid. And he came into that no mas fight. What do you think he said no mas? He wasn't in shape. Wasn't in that kind of shape. And I talked about the psychological fracturing that was going on in that fight on one of our episodes before. So if you guys want to know more about that, go find it. Yeah, Because we're not going to talk about that right now. Um, but there was another one too that nobody talked about. Again, it, it's that it was the template for 
disaster, the template for giving up everything that you gained, everything that you earned, everything that you, you dreamed your life of. Just, just throw it away. Give it back. Leon Spinks with Ali. People forget about that one. Mm-hmm. Very similar. Leon Spinks went out and he partied and he bought cars and he bought houses and he partied and then he came into the, the next the rematch with Ali. And of course, it was the great Ali, but Ali was a shadow of himself. And he wasn't prepared, Leon Spinks, physically, but mentally wasn't prepared. And the same thing with Ruiz. All, all just followed the footsteps of all of those train wrecks, if you will, of, of taking giving back something that you earn, you know, taking victory and turning it into to a loss, just turning it inside out. The one thing I want to ask you about that, and, they, and, and, and many Robles gets a lot of compliments for the job they did in the first fight, but having been in camp with you, with Alex Vosdick, I can't imagine if your fighter was coming in that heavy and and the, the the point I'm making is like you can't have yourself surrounded by yes men that there's no accountability. I can't imagine the fighter coming in with you as the trainer and being that fat for the for the rematch. You have to be complicit with it. Yes, I mean you know you get credit when when a guy wins and you you have to take responsibility you know blame with it. You have know, to. Of course, it's on a fighter. Don't get me wrong; he's a man, grown man, uh, but the. The trainers have a responsibility to, as you just said, they're seeing what's going on. They're not oblivious to it. They're not wearing, you know, blinders like a horse in a race where you can't see what's going on around you. No, no, there's no blinders. A trainer sees what's going on. Everyone sees, manager, everybody. And they go along with it, obviously. I mean, uh, or, you know, maybe they say something, but not to the extent that it makes a difference. And again, it's on the fighter. But they they are going, they're getting paid, they being the team, getting paid uh, to do a job. The job didn't get done. And I, but you saw a metamorphosis. You saw a, you really did. You saw a transition. You saw a rebirth of a new guy. You did. And, and I'm not going to, I'm going to make it big when it's supposed to be made big. And I'm going to bring it back when it's supposed to be brought back or, or put a light on where it should be when it should be. And what I mean by that, give him credit. Give Joshua credit for redeeming himself, for wanting to redeem himself and his people. But he he made a transformation. He became a different guy. I mean, physically he became a different guy. I mean, a different guy. I mean, it was... You know, one of those, like the butterfly, you know, it's a moth and then it's a butterfly. I mean, he he got rid of the bulky muscle. The old timers were taboo about that, about weights, to, to the extreme at least, before they came up with all these different systems where it doesn't have to be to the extreme, where you can still have fluidity in your muscles with weight programs. But he was a Adonis, uh, Joshua, and... The old time is, again, that was taboo. It, it made you stiff. It made you bulky, you know. And he got more swell, swell muscles. He, he, he changed himself. I mean, got rid of the bulky muscles, and he was a whole different athlete, a whole different looking fighter. No doubt about it. And give them credit that the reason why, one of the reasons why I picked Joshua to win the rematch and he quit in the first one, he submitted, was because he did quit, because he knew he did. And you can't hide from that. It'll come to you at 2 in the morning. Mm-hmm. It'll come to you at 3 in the morning. Come to you at inopportune times and bother you, wake you. And I just figured that he's, he's aware of it now. Kind of like Duran after he said, no, my spit out those bad words, no mas. And he didn't know the repercussions until he knew the repercussions. When he submitted Joshua, he didn't know the repercussions until he knew the repercussions. And I was bargaining on that. Mm -hmm. I was bargaining that that would take him to where he needed to go. And obviously, obviously it did. But also, 
also was, you could see, uh, one of the reasons I felt more strong about my pick was when I heard he was making a change. And I'll tell you why. Because all it meant to me was that he had taken inventory of himself in a way that I would hope he did. And he recognized it and something had to change. Some guys that just say, no, I just have to be better or I just have to be, what's that mean? Some guys would just say, no, I, you know, they ignore it. They don't want to face it. They don't want to, you know, look it in the eye, whatever that is. The devil coming to your door and, and saying, ha, you know, <laughs> I, I was there. I, he looked it in the eye. He looked at what it was. And when he said, when they said they were going to, and I saw the pictures of his body, whether it was going to make a difference or not, the difference was that they were accepting responsibility that something had to be different. They were saying something has to be different. And that's all I needed to know. And when he walked into that ring, it wasn't just the body. Here's the part I want to put more of a light on. Yeah, everyone in the world saw the body. He went from a monster truck to a Porsche. <laughs> he went from a Jaguar, if we're going to go into the animal kingdom, a tiger, you know, a lion, to a fox. Mm -hmm. Sly fox. <laughs> Quick fox. Taking little little pieces and then running off somewhere. Yeah. You know, and not everybody would like a fox. You know, some of them wear them on their <laughs> as coats. But he, everyone could see that physical change but i saw the mental change i saw the within change he was serious it, it was almost a tinge of anger it was good mm -hmm. it was almost a tinge of anger like i'm here to rectify something i'm angry at the way i was last time i was here i'm i'm freaking pissed i and there was a controlled fear Oh, Teddy, blah, blah, blah. yeah, there was controlled fear. A fear about what could happen if he didn't make it not happen. You know what fear is sometimes? Everyone, it's such a taboo word in our society. Everyone, nobody wants to hear it. Everybody runs away from it. Nobody, will, oh, it means you're coward. But I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's all around us. It's around us every second. Fear is there to be used. It's there with nature, the same way as fruit on the trees. Rain in the sky. Wind in the sun. It's there to live. It's there to succeed. It's there to survive. It's a part of our makeup. It's a part of what we need the necessities we need for life. If we ignore it, we're condemned to not be prepared to face the things that fear tells us to be prepared to face without it. You know what, what, what I saw in him with the fear? I saw awareness. The element of awareness. There's a tinge of fear with awareness. Again, people will never use that. Oh, I didn't think of it that way. There's a tinge of fear connected to awareness. If you're aware of something, something that's important, something that can be difficult, maybe even dangerous, there's a tinge of fear that makes you aware. How are you aware if there's not a tinge of fear to make you aware, to make you ready, to make you alert, to make you cognizant of what you're facing? To make sure that you face it, that you're going to do something about it. I saw that in him. That was the biggest difference I saw. I said, yeah, I knew his body was different. We saw it on, on the internet weeks before, but we didn't see that look. I saw that look of, I'm going to be a pro tonight. The look you're supposed to have when you walk into a courtroom, into an operating room if you're a doctor, into a classroom if you're a teacher. That look, I'm ready to do my job. Mm -hmm. The first time, what did we saw? We saw him laughing and uh, giggling and like, like, like it wasn't important. I know some people say, well, he was loose. Yeah, he was real loose, especially when he got dropped a few times and then just 
put his arms on the ropes and just waited for the referee to stop it. Even in the buildup, letting Ruiz hold his belts at the at the weigh-in? Yeah. Why would you ever do that? All like, of that. It's just this. All of it. But this time he came in lock and loaded. Yep. In the right way. Lock and loaded. And he was angry. He was talking to Ruiz later. But but it was the, the right kind of anger. Was exactly. A, it, it was it was not a not an anger that we again we use the word you know socially as a, oh, oh, oh guy's angry what, what misplaced anger no it was a well placed anger it was a personal anger yep. angry at himself he wasn't angry at the guy he was angry at himself he was just just angry that he allowed himself to behave the wrong way mm-hmm. not to behave the way that he needed to behave and now he was ready to behave the way that he needed to behave and again he was that was the difference that's what I noticed and listen what I talked about, I'm also going to pull back on it. You know, he wasn't, he was beating a 283 pound guy, but he can only be responsible for his part. That's right. He was prepared to be different. Ruiz wasn't prepared the way he needed to be prepared. So before I go crazy and make this guy, you know, something that I shouldn't make him, I'm giving him all the credit he deserves for doing what he had to do with what he had to yep. do it with. That's a good point. And he did. But he wasn't in there with Joe Frazier. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, he wasn't in there with George Foreman. He wasn't in there. And I know those guys don't exist anymore. Now, but he wasn't even in there with a prepared Ruiz. Mm-hmm. He was in there with a guy who, again, just like Leon Spinks did, just like Durant did, just like Buster Douglas did, went down that, treacherous road of allowing the fame and the money to make you forget about how you want to feel about yourself the day after Mm -hmm. and the day after and the day after and it can be you know it can be as devastating that fame and that money can be more devastating than any punch you ever get hit with ever and if you allow it to be and that's why I have so much, I, I'll skip to a sport, but I have so much respect for the guys like Michael Jordan that with all the fame, all the fortune, all of it, LeBron James, I mean, there's a lot of them, that they never lost, you know, we use the word hunger, but they never lose that respect for what they have. I'm not going to use the word hunger. I'm going to use the word respect. That's the word for me. And some people are going to say doing my tweets and stuff out there, you know, I, I, I'm a tweeter bird. I learned, <laughs> Rob, my daughter taught me how to tweet. I tweet, tweet, tweet. <laughs> and, and I was tweeting like a madman. And they're going to say, oh, you were harsh. You were, uh, you know, you were mean. You were I wasn't mean. I was, I was taking what was there to take. He, how could I disrespect somebody? I wasn't meaning to disrespect him. How can I disrespect Ruiz with my tweets, Ken, if he's not respecting himself? That's why I was bringing attention. That, that yeah, I, I'm pissed that you're not respecting the sport. You're not respecting yourself. You're not respecting any of the people that have traveled through their journeys in this great sport to behave this way, to act this way, to come in this 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 reckless and disregarding of of what you should have been caring about this opportunity the opportunity to to stay a champion to be a better champion to be a great champion that that you just you just sniveled at it you know you took and you blew your nose in it that's why i said those things because they deserve to be said because of the way he acted, the way he positioned, he put himself in. I was saying the truth. Yeah, in a clever way, in a a funny way, but the truth, the truth, that he allowed to become the truth. That because it, it, it bothered me that he cared so little about those things, those things that come very rarely. Those opportunities. And listen, I give him all the credit for the world talking about Ruiz, that he got off the floor and he won the damn thing. 
the first time. All the credit in the freaking world. But I also point out all the things in the freaking world that he did wrong after in the second fight. Yeah, cost himself a huge, uh, huge blow to his reputation and his uh, bank account. And then after the fight, immediately he's saying, oh, next time, let's do a third one. I'm going to come in ready to roll. Like the chances of him seeing a rematch with uh, No, no, Joshua there is a chance. I'll tell you why, Ken. Who are they going to beat? Uh, because there's still more of a road to go down. In other words, who are they going to fight? They're only going to fight guys they control. Mm-hmm. That Hearns controls, that the zone controls. Only they're not going to fight guys that are with another network, with another promoter, Un- unless it's so big that they can work out a deal, which happens, mm-hmm. which happens. But but right now, and let me say something else. Let me qualify this by saying something that needs to be said. We didn't see, you know, you see those movies that people like to watch. You know, those Marvel movies, the Marvel heroes and comic book. I love those comic books. I I used to have a big collection. Mm -hmm. Spider-Man, Hulk, all those guys. But you see always one of these monster movies coming back. Godzilla comes back. Godzilla, you know, they found him. He was sleeping for 10 years underneath, (laughs) right? Right? And And he comes back. And that wasn't Godzilla coming back. And again, I I just, what I do, I just spent 20 minutes giving them all the praise in the world. And I'm not knocking them. I'm here just the same reason that light's here. Same reason that light's here. Why is that light there? Why did Rob put that light there? So you could see. So you could see. I just showing you what I see. We didn't see the the rebirth, the refinding of Godzilla. We saw a new guy. But I saw fragileness. Tell me if I'm wrong. But yeah, I give him credit for all the things I saw. But I still saw Humpty Dumpty fall and get broken into a million parts and and do what doesn't always get done. Get put back together. But I still had a funny feeling every once in a while, those small spots where Ruiz did move his hands, mm-hmm. where he did get close. Is Humpty Dumpty really back together? Mm-hmm. Is Humpty Dumpty going to fall apart again? Do I see an eggshell? <laughs> Do I see a crack in an eggshell? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we, we got the light, baby. I, I'm, we're going to say it all. You know, I'm, I'm sure Hearn, Hearn watches the show. I'm sure at first he was saying, bravo, bravo, bravo. That's great. Thank you. And now he's saying, no, <laughs> stop, stop. You ne- you've never seen a happier guy than Eddie Hearn stop. when he won that fight. Yeah, but let me tell you something. Calm down, Eddie. A little bit. I get it. I get it. A lot of money involved. I get it. I really do. I do. But please, you know what I mean? You stop acting like you just defeated the, you know, he, he called him the king. The king is back. The king, the king is back. Eddie, Eddie, he didn't just beat the Roman Empire, the Roman uh, uh, army. Uh, you know the, uh, the one of the when they were powerful the the Roman uh, uh, you know gl- uh, army of uh, the Roman Empire he he didn't just defeat them you know what I mean it, it was kind of it was more like a college fraternity of uh, kids <laughs> at a cake party <laughs> you know what I mean it was more like you just defeated like the the you know the what they call the fraternities alpha the uh, <laughs> yeah, the Greeks. Uh, yeah, uh, in the fraternities, when they have a fraternity in college, you know, Sigma or something, you yeah, know, they have all different names. Uh, you, you defeated one of them, you yeah. know, in the middle of a cake party, <laughs> in an uh, intramural basketball game. I mean, because that's kind of what Ruiz represented himself as. Yeah, on that night uh, for sure. Uh, on that night, so yeah, again, you know, you didn't exactly beat the the old Roman Empire and. But you did what you had to do. And, but I still, I think you'd be lying if, I mean, fans, the word fan is fanatic. It's short for fanatic. So we get crazy. You, know, you see what you want to see. But you had to see in those moments. And he survived those moments. And he did what he had to do. He grabbed, he did, he survived. But there were moments where you had to see some fragileness. You had to be worried. For sure. I mean, your heart had to, if you were a fan of Joshua, your heart had to go, boop, boop. You know, I mean, really. Uh, you know, and 
you had to be honest with yourself and it's it's not what you saw when he's not the guy that we thought he was going to be mm -hmm. and again give him credit for his rebirth give him credit for coming back and reinventing himself and doing what he had to do especially on the mental side the emotional side the psychological side facing what he had to do and redeeming himself but is there anyone out there who's going to argue with me that he's not the guy we had hoped he would be? I think that's fair. That when he got off the floor against Klitschko, this big, strong guy who, who could take a punch, who could make you miss right in front of you and take you apart, you know, and, and do what he had to do in that sort of, in that sort of way. Uh, the guy that we thought we were going to be watching for maybe a lot of years in that kind of way. Uh, and you can you can be successful in the way he was, you know, in, in moving and boxing and doing that uh, and making that transition as he has. But again, give him credit for the success, but recognize the other part, that there was a fragileness still hovering almost like, like a cloud over the ring. I saw it. I felt it. Yeah, for sure. Every time Rui got close, like, oh, ho, 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 you know, <laughs> and, and you didn't feel that before. You weren't maybe aware that he had that flaw before. All right. But you, you didn't feel it. And like I said, the Klitschko, in the Klitschko fight, he was, he was the guy that you thought he was, that you, you thought you were going to continue seeing maybe for a long time. A strong guy that you know he he would he could stay right there with a guy a guy that quite frankly if if he had been prepared to be that guy the first Ruiz fight I think he takes Ruiz apart yeah a lot of people are gonna go nuts off that the first Ruiz fight yeah mm -hmm. and and I almost got insulted by one of the sideline reporters saying oh like like they're giving you a great revelation like you this time. He did what his trainer told him to do the first time, but he didn't listen to the first time. Get the frig out of here with that malarkey. <laughs> the first time he had no plan. Get out of here with that. Please, don't insult me in this business. Insult me in football, because I don't know maybe as much. But in this business, don't tell me, oh, he did what he was supposed to do the first time. And and he moved, uh, what, run all over the place? And, you know, and again, he boxed the way he needed to now. Because he became that guy now. Yeah. But the first time, he didn't have to be that guy. He could have been the guy that he was supposed to be in the first fight. But he made too much money. He slept in too many silk sheets like Marvin Hagler. He didn't come there prepared that night. Like you said, the way he was behaving before the fight. He didn't come prepared to behave like a fighter. He didn't come that way in Madison Square Garden. He was. If he had, he would have taken Ruiz apart. Yeah, I know some people ain't going to like it. But he would have. But he wasn't prepared. And Ruiz was. And give him credit. I'll give it to him again if you didn't hear, if you have cotton in your ears. And you didn't hear it. I'll give him credit again. But please, don't take me down that make-believe fairy tale road for your sake. That, to show how you want to make it. How smart you are. Oh, this time he did what he was, what they planned to do the Get the freak out of here. They planned to do that the first. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. They planned to show up and win. That's the problem. They planned to just show up and win. And they almost did when he dropped him with the left hook. Yeah. Problem. Luis got up mm -hmm. and said, okay, what's next? Mm -hmm. Like a fighter <laughs> says. A fighter's supposed to say. And Chasha wasn't a guy that he was with Klitschko. Why? I said it before on this show. I'd say it one more time in an abbreviated version. Because he had too many more millions of dollars in his bank account than he had when he fought Klitschko. He had that safety net in his mind that he didn't have to behave that way. That he didn't have to behave that way. But he was wrong. Because being rich does not protect you from being poor. <laughs> in the right ways and in the wrong ways. Because you could be poor in a lot of other ways even though you're rich in the bank account. And he found out that night that being rich 
is not a protective device from being poor. Poor in your soul. Poor inside in your mind, in your heart. In the places that it matters to be rich. He was in search of being rich again. Rich in those ways. And he became rich again in those ways. And his bank account is still big and it, it, it was never hurt. But he was hurt in other areas. Mm -hmm. And that's what he learned. He learned that just because you got money, just because you got fame, just because you have all those things, it does not protect you from being, being the poorest of the poor, being homeless. Being homeless in the state of mind of homelessness, mm -hmm. in the state of mind that you don't have a home because you've given it up. Your home is you. Your home is internally. It begins with how you feel about yourself. Mm -hmm. He gave that up. He lost that. And he wanted to get that back. And so, again, don't give me that freaking crap that, oh, this time he listened to his trainer. The first time he didn't. No. The first time he didn't listen to anybody. <laughs> First time he just went there to show up. I'm Joshua. I'm a millionaire. I, I punch pretty good. And this guy is, you know, soft. And, and, and I'm just going to get in there. I, I, I'm tired of behaving like a fighter. I'm tired of earning the right every minute to be a champion. Because you earn the right every minute. You earn it every minute. You don't earn it one night and then say, okay, now I'll put it on the shelf. And, and it, is, it is, you know, it is still, it is, it's close enough. No, you got to wear it every minute. Every minute to stay a champion. Every minute. And he, he forgot about that. He forgot all about that. So that night against Ruiz in Madison Square Garden, he didn't come there. It, it wasn't supposed to box. There was no plan. He was going to show up and he was going to get in, win and go home. Yep. And didn't work out, did it? No. Because it don't work out. It don't work out. So... That, I'm sorry, but I had to, that was like, are you kidding me? People are listening to this? <laughs> are you serious? Had a, oh, he should have done what he, so this is what the trainer meant him to do the first time. <laughs> God, makes you worry about mushrooms. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, before we get in, before we get into where it leaves the state of the heavyweight division and what, what all the implications involved, I just want to take a quick pause again to shout out to Athletic Greens again, a product we both use and love. Check them out, athleticgreens.com. Use the promo code Atlas for a free offer there. And also, if you like hit listening to Teddy, check out his audio book on Audible.com. Um, you can find it there on Amazon. They'll link to the audio file, um, Teddy's audio book. Um, Teddy, what 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 are we? What should we look for next from Joshua? I would imagine they're not looking for any steep challenges. Again, in the we near saw future. Ken. That's the right question. We saw what we saw. Yeah, again, again, bravo, bravo. You went in there. You faced what you had to face yourself. You faced yourself, and you won. I give you all the credit in the world for that. But you are now a different guy physically and where you got to box. You, again, we don't feel that force anymore. We don't feel that certainty that, that he could get in there and he could take a shot and he could uh, you'd stand right there and make a bang, 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 and, and stand your ground. Because if he was that guy, he could have done that and just took Ruiz out of there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know Ruiz has a decent chin. He's got a heart and all. But please, he's not, he's not, a, you know, he's not hard to hit. You know, the, so some of the old times would say, you know, uh, he, he's harder to miss than to hit. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it's not like he's uh, Mayweather in there or yeah. Pinnell Whitaker in there. I mean, if, if he had that stout, if he had that, again, that whatever you want to call it to simplify it, that hunger, that, that just that component of wanting to be that. He didn't want to be that at Madison Square Garden. But if he had that, he could have just stayed there, bang, 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 and make a miss, boom, bang, bang, and just taking the guy apart. I mean, can you imagine Tyson in his heyday against Ruiz? And again, I'm not taking nothing away from him. Or Joe Lewis, or, or any, I'm Joe Frazier. Mm -hmm. 
you know, they would have dug in and, you know, would have been responsible, move your head when you have to, punch inside those wide shots. But come on, you didn't have to go all over the ring. But now he does. Now he does. Now he's that guy. Okay. That guy was good that night. It showed the positive effects that it would show that night against Ruiz, being that new guy. But how does that... How does that stack up with other guys? Now, that new guy, the guy who's, you know, a different physical guy, a guy who still has, you, you see a fragileness, maybe some of it will go away, but a guy that's going to move and that's going to, uh, a, a, a heavyweight, a, still a 240 pound, 230 something pound athlete who now fights like the mind center is a lightweight. You know, right? He, he, you know, he's he's still that, you know, he, he's still that big, you know, new prototypical heavyweight that is in this era. In the old days, you know, the heavyweights were 100. Marciano, they were 180 pounds. Joe Lewis, 200 pounds. Mm -hmm. You know, Ali, 215, 220. They're getting bigger, bigger. Joe Frazier, 205, 210, 250. And get bigger, bigger. And now you got these big, big guys so he's still a big guy he's he's changed himself he's 10 pounds lighter and he's changed obviously his his muscle tone but he's he's a big guy now being driven by a little guy by a little guy's mentality like he he's heavyweight fighting like a lightweight mm -hmm. you know he he's uh you know he's goliath with david in his head you know and so how does that stack up now it stacked up good against Ruiz. How does it stack up now against some of the other guys? I think the two mandatories in line are Pulev and, uh, for one of the belts and um, Usyk for the other. I can't imagine he'd want to get in there with Usyk, who can also box and move his feet. I, it, it's all a matter. First, it starts with who are these guys affiliated with. It yeah. has to start with that, unfortunately, yep. because it keeps us from having the best fight sometimes. Mm -hmm. But it has to start with who who the other fighters are attached to promotionally with networks and promoters because Hearn's not letting them go outside the ranch. No. And so that's number one. Usyk is with uh, the zone, I believe. Yeah. And and it's not the way it was in a day past. In the day past, when we first looked at this, I'll put my hand up. I admit it. It's tough, but I admit it that I thought Joshua was, was probably the best heavyweight out there. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone could really, other than maybe the real stout fans that just love him for loving him. And part of it may be uh, nationalistic love with mm -hmm. the country and everything else, maybe. But I, I no longer can think that this guy could be Wilder or Fury just like that. I, I can no longer think that. I used to think it before, mm -hmm. and I had a reason to think it. But I no longer can say, oh, I can see this guy, you know, handling Wilder, Fury, or any, well, those are the two top guys. So it's a, it's a whole new world now for him. So when you ask me the question, how's he stack up? Who's he fight next? First of all, he's going to fight someone that they control, Hearn and the zone. And they're going to have to be very, as much as they did this, privately, when the doors are closed, they got to say, okay, we got to. We got to understand now. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we saw the thing Teddy's talking about. We did say that. You know, he did terrific. He came back. Again, all the credit in the world. But there was a fragileness. Now he's a boxer. Now he's a mover. He's a guy, you know, now he's a guy where he was the physically strong guy. Now somebody else could be the lion. They could make him the prey because he's a fox now. Mm -hmm. Foxes get eaten sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes lions like to snack on a fox. Sometimes <laughs> they do. They, the tail gets stuck in between their teeth, but they pull that out and they get rid of it. So, you again, you have to reevaluate. You know, everything is relative. So now this new Joshua, this guy that moves, this guy that that you know is you know very nervous, but he's using his nervousness. He's very cautious, and he's fighting that kind of fight. How does he stack up with you know? It's a, it's interesting because he knocked out Dylan White uh, a couple of years ago, and I like Dylan White, even though I thought he was too heavy. Mm 
Yeah. Uh, and and we've we've gone to bat for Dylan White on the show. And by the way, he was cleared uh, yeah. by the UK anti-doping. Uh, yeah. They said that for whatever, I, I didn't see all the specifics, but they, they very cleared glad him. to hear that. Yeah. Because we we did go to bat for him, mm-hmm. and we yelled when he wasn't being treated right mm-hmm. by by these these <laughs> sanctioning organizations, whatever you want to call them, and he wasn't being given his mandatory challenge uh for the wbc yeah uh, so we we really attacked them for that mm-hmm. rightfully so mm-hmm. someone has to do it so and why not us why not put down to be honest with you when people say that we wait for the b sample and they and they start to raise doubts about previously when they would raise doubts about failed doping tests i would think they were just full of shit that like come on man you're not getting a false positive but then they had this kid nate diaz for the ufc had a they said they had a suspicious finding in rat, and they told him like, "Keep it to yourself. Let's wait till after the fight with the Masvidal fight." And he said, "I'm not keeping this to myself. I didn't do this, and I'm not going to keep it to myself." And what do you know? Usada had to come up and be like, "Yeah, you're right. It wasn't a, a legit finding," which throws into question all of these uh, findings of positives. I mean, not all of them. I mean, you got to be careful with that because a lot of these guys are dirty. A hundred percent. I was. That's what I was getting to. Is that you have to. It, 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 it makes it hard to just believe that the pe- people are dirty. But I think that there is doping is rampant in boxing in all sports. I really do. I, and, so I tend to it think, take it on the surface like, yeah, they're definitely dirty. But when you get guys that are cleared and it's obvious that they did get a false positive. We need better policies. Yeah, 100%. That's what we need. 100%. We we need the proper policies that, that are there to be used, but we don't use them. The whole and, thing and is it, a mess. And it has to be mandated, not, not you choose and and cherry pick who gets tested. Oh, no, nah, not today. We're not going to test them. Nah, nah, you don't have to get tested. I don't want to be tested. All right, you're not being tested. I mean, come on. You, you can you, test you, me the night of the fight, before yeah, and after please. the fight. You have the broad testing, period. At 24-7, and, and, and 365. We don't have that. And we have a problem. But the thing I'm saying now is just that with Dylan White, with a guy like him, and, and he's with, them. So there's a good chance that fight could happen. Mm-hmm. Those are the fights that can happen mm-hmm. because of the affiliations. And I, he deserves a shot. And we, we fought for him to get a shot. He was supposed to get a shot against uh, Wilder. Mm-hmm. And, and he never got it. He got it stopped. I think it was in four or five rounds a couple of years ago. He wasn't really ready. Yeah, It's a whole different ball game now. For sure. Because in two ways, Dylan White is a different guy, even though he was too heavy, but he... He took this fight light that they gave him like a tune-up fight, and but he shouldn't have done that. But a short he, notice, he, yeah. Get yourself back in shape, um, and he will. He will, I believe, uh, because I think he knows the opportunity. I hope he does. That's in front of him now, and yeah, he got stopped by Joshua. So a lot of people say we won't want to see that again. I'll see it again because mm-hmm. it's a whole different ball game. It's a whole different fight because Dylan is more mature now. He's beaten some good fighters. Uh, He's shown himself that he belongs. And that goes a long way. But Joshua's a whole... It's it's not the same Joshua he fought. That's right. It's not the same guy. This is like that movie, Trading Places. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You remember with Eddie Murphy and (laughs) and Dan Aykroyd? It's a great movie. Yeah, yeah. Robert put that up with my comment. I know it. (laughs) He's the man. But that's what... This is a... That ain't Joshua no more. This is the new Joshua. You know, without an A. (laughs) Joshua. (laughs) It's a whole different ball game now. And Dylan White, with the Joshua that moves all over the ring, Dylan White might be able to track him down, at least kick him in there thinking he can. That before, you know, he, he got in trouble for doing that, for standing in front of him. But now he could go right after him, and, and he again he could be the tiger after the fox. Mm-hmm. It's a whole. It's changed. It's it's a, It's really interesting in that way. That first fight was four years ago, December twenty fifteen. Yeah, and it was a TKO in the seventh. TKO in the seventh in uh, two thousand fifteen. Uh, Joshua beat White. You think um, you think there's any chance they take the fight with uh, Usyk? No, I mean, yes and no. I mean, Usyk is a candidate because he's with his own, and right? He's, and he's a mandatory for one of the yeah, four belts he yeah, has. Yeah, but that's the problem. You got four belts, you could say, I'll give that one up if you want to avoid someone. I think Usyk, I said this a year ago, I think, when he first announced that he was going to 
move from cruiserweight. Um, I think he's going to be a heavyweight champ. I do too. I, I really do. I think, and I think the opportunity is going to, when I first said it, people were like, oh my God, he's not big enough. Uh, do you, you still believe that? <laughs> do you still believe that? Because we just saw Joshua shrink. Well, you shrink, literally shrink, get smaller, but change and shrink in different ways, in different dimensions that I've been explaining here. And there's another one from my man, Rob. Honey, you shrunk the kids. <laughs> there it is. Honey, you shrunk the kids, baby. I, because do you still think Usyk is too small? No, I don't. Because he's fighting a guy who's still Goliath, big guy, bigger than Usyk. But again, the guy driving him now is David. Mm-hmm. The guy with the slingshot. Remember him? <laughs> oh, yeah. Remember him? He's got a different mentality, baby. He, he, he thinks a little differently. And Joshua thinks differently now. So it's all, so now Usyk, he's not in there with these big monsters, you know. Uh, now now it's a, the playing field has suddenly changed. It has suddenly evened out a little bit for a guy like Usyk, who's a winner, who's got that great amateur pedigree, who, who's a world champion in his own right, undefeated, who, who's got a brain in his head, who has legs, who hangs out and is affiliated with Lomachenko and in Lomachenko's father, who's very smart. Yeah, it's a whole different ball game. A whole different ball game. Hypothetically, this fight's never going to happen, I don't think, not in the near future. Um, Joshua versus the winner of um, Wilder and Fury. But if you're Joshua, who would you prefer? Hypothetically, if you had to fight the winner, who do you think Joshua wants to see win that fight? Who does he stand a better chance against in his mind? Fury or Wilder? Who oh, Joshua stayed up at? Yeah, if Joshua had to pick who he'd want to, I, I, that'd that take me. It'd probably take me uh, two seconds to answer that one. Fury, because because the power uh, would not be there. The the danger, the the sledgehammer, the guillotine, bop, over. You know, and and uh, that. The element that could bring ghosts back. You know, Joshua has been exercised, but the ghost could come back. You got to be ready. You get Ghostbusters. <laughs> you got you to gotta have one of those masks and one of those guns, you know, just in case one of those buggers show up. Because <laughs> you never know, Ken, when one of those buggers show up, you got to zap them, you know, <laughs> because they could show up again. And... If and it's the right answer for me. If Joshua was in the ring with Wilder, the ghost could show up again mm-hmm. because he's got the thing that could bring the ghost, that right hand. And no one's been able to avoid it for twelve rounds, yeah, so, including Fury. So, so much better off for Fury because Fury, you can get away with shenanigans. Mm-hmm. You could, you could play. I'm, I'm not making this frivolous and and lighthearted. I never do that to this sport. But you can play around with. Fury, you can you can box, you can steal time, you can you you can you can get a break. Yeah, Wilder's always looking for the right hand. You know, he's always in search and destroy mode. It's a it's a different it's a different feel. It's a, it's a whole different hunt, if you will, when you're going out there hunting. So it's 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 different. So Fury, yeah, he's big, he's agile. He he's technically maybe the most sound of the heavyweights. I give him credit for all that and he's got a great story but again uh he doesn't keep you know he doesn't press the metal to the floor he doesn't keep his foot on the pedal all the time right. in that kind of way uh where you have that hanging over your head mm-hmm. so yeah in a second in a second fury and that's no knock on fury i'm just showing the differences that's all how do you get the top three in the heavyweight division ranked right now wild and number one I agree. In the wild are number one, you know. And wild are, you know, I don't read none of the stuff out there. Most of you guys know that already. So if you're trying to get to me, stop. It don't work that way. I don't mean in a good way, in a, in a bad way. If you're trying to, like, I don't read it. But every once in a while I hear, you know, where Wilder said, oh, Teddy's always knocking me. I just made him the heavy, the hardest punch in heavyweight I've ever seen. 
Huh? So is it not going to always pointing things out? Anyone is it who not thinks he's knocking you, he hasn't listened to the show himself. Because if oh. he does, he'd know that we're big fans. But, we like well, him. No, we're no. Just, we, but we, if we, I point out, if I point out, I don't like everything about him. Exactly. I'm not, not going to lie. But if if I point out what he does wrong, that's not going to always that pointing out what he's doing wrong. Exactly. Uh, from my seat. Yeah. And, and the hardest punch of, punch, for one punch, Hardest punch I've ever seen in the heavyweight division. That's pretty damn good. Is that a knock? Oh, I don't think so. Like and that. and I'll make him number one. You just asked a question. I'll make him number one um, because he, I think he should be number one right now, guy. Uh, and then uh, and then number two, number two, I would make Fury and uh, and then Joshua. I yeah. agree. Yeah, I would agree with and that. And then my uh, guy had put another dot in my nose. <laughs> <laughs> that's worth at least one more that's worth right mates that's worth at least one all right you got me okay love you guys of course upon really love yous and i'm genuinely genuinely hey you like my shirt by the way love it i mean the the great late Angelo Dundee. You what never a, disappoint what a, with the t-shirt what game. a great ambassador to the sport one of the greatest corner men ever yep People don't even realize he was probably the greatest cut man, or one of the greatest. Him and Freddie Brown, I think it's terrible. Freddie Brown's not in the Hall of Fame, but um, but one of the greatest corner men ever. And uh, and I was in the gym. It doesn't exist anymore. They have got a new place, you know, whatever. Um, but the original Fifth Street gym, I trained fighters there, and uh, you know, thirty years ago, 25, 30 years, whatever it was, I don't know how many years ago, I trained Simon Brown there. He was welterweight champ of the world. I trained him there for a title defense. And I trained uh, Chris Tiozo, the former junior, super middleweight champion, 168 pound champion from France mm -hmm. uh, of the world. I trained him there. Um, so I trained two fighters there. I might have trained someone else, but at least in the old fit and listen it was run down it was like you know it wasn't you know this shirt looks better than the gym looked you know <laughs> but but it was the gym it was the original i didn't care what it looked like yeah it was, you know it was it, it was not in great shape but i didn't care it was the place it mm -hmm. was the real original place it doesn't exist no more mm -hmm. i think it's condos or something or some, some kind of uh takeout restaurant but <laughs> It, it was a place where Ali trained, where Dundee was. It, it was the place, mm -hmm. the place where he got ready for Liston. Uh, the place where he got, you know, I mean, God. Such an interesting dichotomy from the uh, scene of the heavyweight fight this weekend in Saudi Arabia with all the pomp and circumstance over there. But one thing that was interesting is they had an outdoor arena in the desert. And, of course, what happens in the desert? Pisses down rain <laughs> during the main event. They have the announcers are in, like, plastic capes completely unprepared and it was um an interesting uh second act for saudi arabia when they had the ufc there this summer this summer in the middle of the summer the air conditioner goes off they see the announcers are also soaking wet but from sweat not from rain and it was just been two two events there that have like everything that could go wrong seemingly has gone wrong for them but they're gonna keep trying yeah i mean listen the government gave them 50 million dollars that's the number i got uh, the government in Saudi Arabia gave fifty million. That's a pretty good number. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I hope they give it to other fighters to go over there because I want fighters. This is my business. Uh, this is a business I've been in my whole life. I want fighters to make money to as much as they can because I know what they're risking when they get in the ring. I know when they go in the ring, they come out of the ring with less of themselves. So I want them to get more. So if that could become uh, another player. In, in our sport where the sheiks and whatever they are over there with all that money or that oil money if they can give it to some of our fighters and uh where our businesses can benefit and our fighters can benefit from it hey yeah i, I even put one of those turbans on <laughs> i could see you over there in the white uh, traditional garb well <laughs> if it's not too hot <laughs> You know, because I don't know how you wear those things when it's really hot. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah there has to be a summer one. <laughs> right, Ken? I would hope so. There's got to be a summer <laughs> one with a little knit. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Right? Yeah, yeah. Red breeze. Maybe a linen. 
Let him. It, it breathes a little bit. Teddy, just to circle back real quick on the uh, Joshua Ruiz possibility of a trilogy here. What do you think the possibilities are of seeing that? Again, Joshua, uh, Ruiz had the mandatory rematch, so he had to give him the rematch on the zone. But don't forget, Ruiz is with PBC. So what do you think the chances are we see a third one there? I think I don't want to see it. Again, the truth is the truth. I'm, I'm not going to play games with anybody. I don't want to see it. I think he lost his right to see it. But there's been other fighters, other athletes in other sports and that get another chance after they screw up, you know. And so I'm not saying that he won't. Uh, but I think he, I wouldn't want to watch it. I think there's a possibility. Why? Not because it was an enticing fight to watch. There was no reason to watch it again, really. Mm -hmm. But because... Two reasons. One, there's no one else. Who, who's going to fight that they can feel that they can feel. I'm not saying you can be completely safe with him, but they can, even if he gets in better shape, he's still going to be that pondering, that, that guy with cement in his feet, predictable, one-dimensional guy, especially if you're boxing him on the parameters of the ring. If you're boxing him on the outside the way, of course, Joshua did, you're going to see the flaws. The, some of the flaws is you're seeing whether he's 15 pounds less or 15 pounds more. You're still going to see, again, a slow-moving, ponderous guy that that is, uh, you know, once he moves his hands, he's got a decent hand speed, but he's not a guy who's always on you. He's not a guy who's real active. It's only spots you have to worry about. Mm -hmm. and, and again, he's a one-dimensional guy. Someone's got to teach him how to cut the ring down too. Mm -hmm. But... So you're still going to have to give that. And it doesn't make me excited to say, oh, let me mark that in my calendar when that rematch is coming. I can't wait to see that one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, unless Carvel has a special that night. Then, <laughs> then I'm going to Carvel. Yeah, but other than that, yeah, I'm watching that, baby. You know? But so, so there's a possibility that they feel that there's... There's a lot of guys, there's danger in their fighting. Danger in fighting because making the deal that you still control what you have to control, you know, uh, having the options on the guy, have either he's under your uh, under your promotional banner or at least you have options like like uh, the promoters do, like King started years ago, where if you want to fight his guy, you got to sign options. And now you're with me, baby. So, so that so they can only fight certain guys and they can only feel safe against certain guys. I can see them feeling safe, you know, saying, okay, this is a guy we can we we can beat again. Yeah. For the reasons I said. So for those reasons, out of necessity, because I look at necessity in this business, out of necessity, out of the business part of it, uh and, and maybe they could sell it'd be hard to sell it to me, but maybe they could sell that this this time he'll be in shape and he'll do what he did the first time. Yeah. Which I'm not buying. No. But yeah, I it's a possibility. Uh-huh. It's a possibility. And um well to finish up here, I wanna I was just with this shirt that I'm wearing, you know, it, it made me think about Ali because of course the Dundee trained Ali, trained Sugar Ray Lenny, trained a lot of real good fighters. And people forget back in the day he had this gym in Miami. Uh, his brother was one of the biggest promoters in the country, Chris Dundee. A lot of people don't realize that. He, and that's how Angelo got started in the business because he would train some of his fighters or work the corner. So he, Angelo really served an apprenticeship the way that nowadays guys don't really get a chance to serve. That's why you don't have a lot of good trainers coming up. You have some, but not enough. And because they, they're not serving an apprenticeship. And... I remember this brings back memories for me, this this shirt of training fighters at the original Fit Street Gym, but also memories of, you were talking about Athletic Greens earlier, mm -hmm. and uh, I got a nice kit that was sent to me by them, and I thanked them for it. They sent me a nice box of uh, how to put it together. I mean, besides the ingredients that, of course, you got to drink and you got to put in your body, and I like it. I, I like the idea that I'm helping myself. Mm -hmm. That, you know, staying away from uh, some of the stuff that Ruiz made too available. <laughs> you, you know, that just wrong things. And so one thing about it is that you know you, 
you're putting something in your body that's right. So I've been taking it in the morning, and um, and they like I said, they sent me a nice kit, you know, with with the jar and with the spoon and with how to mix it and how to you know how to get it ready and the whole thing. And it made me think. <laughs> it's a funny story. It made me think about years ago, Ali. Cuz had a relationship. Cuz Samana, my mentor, had a relationship with Ali. He was a mentor to Ali, actually. And Ali had great respect for him. And so Cuz took me to meet Ali. And he took me to the Deer, uh, Deer Lake training camp, uh, Deer Lake, Pennsylvania, where he had his own training camp, which was quite a place with log cabins and everything. And he had these big rocks there with the names of all the heavyweight champions on every big rock. It was really pretty amazing he had it there so he took me there but he also took me to the concord hotel in the old days a lot of the fighters trained up in monticello uh in the catskills in new york where they were trained at grossinger's or at um the concord and he was trained at the concord for the third his third fight with norton with ken norton mm -hmm. outdoors in yankee stadium so whatever year that was rob will figure it out that's how many years ago it was mm -hmm. and I, me and Cus went to the fight at Yankee Stadium, by the way. We went there to see Ali. And he, so he fought, so, so he's training at the Concord. So Cus takes me to the Concord, and I meet Ali, and it's Ali. God. And he's got the whole floor. You know, I'm a 19-year-old I'm a kid. And he's got the whole, he's got the whole floor of the Concord, one of the floors. And it's his floor. Like, where, where are you staying? Everywhere, he said to me. <laughs> Every, wherever I want, <laughs> wherever I want, he's, this is all mine. And I'm 19, I'm like, he's got the whole floor of the Concord Hotel. So he says, come here, you wanna see something? Ali's asking, you wanna see something? What are you gonna say, no? <laughs> so I follow, like a little kid. I follow him, he opens up the door, cuz is smiling, because cuz likes that he's, you know, that he's doing this with me. And um, so I'm cuz's guy, so of course he's treating me good. So he opens up the door, come on, come in, and it's a room. It's a room, just a big room that's got all these boxes, all these containers. And you know what they look like? They look like the box I got sent by Athletic Greens mm -hmm. because that's what they are. They're all kinds of nutriment stuff. Back in the day when this stuff was just, it was new. It was new. He was hanging out with a guy named Eddie Gregory. Eddie Gregory was an activist, and he was a comedian, and he became a health health food, you know, nut. Yeah. And and he was into so he was he he got around. Ali was like a collector of people, you know. He's like some people collect cats, you know. He 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 would. Ali was like a big kid. He he would he would just be around all kinds of. He'd listen to anybody. He was a big kid. He loved to do magic tricks with you. Yeah, you go up, he he'd take a handkerchief, and then he and then he pull out, the, pull his thumb out, and the, and he he make you he take a dollar from you, and he make it disappear, and you be looking, <laughs> and then he say, "It's gone, it's gone." And, oh, can I get my dollar? It's gone. You know, like, <laughs> he was a big kid. He was he was he was special in a lot of ways, and um, so he's got me in this room, and the room's full of all this athletic green type stuff. Uh, all kinds of boxes of vegetables, boxes of of fruits, all, all just and blenders, blenders. I I was like, what is this? He goes, yeah, this guy. He's and then he'd look around to see if anyone was listening. You know, he goes, this guy, he, he's a little crazy. He he got me drinking this stuff. I said, oh, well, yeah. He goes, yeah, he, he crazy man. He shut that door so he don't look in here. <laughs> and so we shut the door, and again we got all these crates of of vegetables, produce, and produce you know. <laughs> and so he goes, "Yeah, he, he make me drink this stuff." He goes, "He goes, look." And so he starts taking stuff out, and he puts it in a blender, and he's blending it all up, and it's all green. To be honest, that's the color it was yeah. like athletic greens. And um, so he, he blends it all up. He goes, "Yeah, he makes me drink all this." He goes, "You want some?" It's Muhammad Ali. Ken, yeah. it's Muhammad Ali. What would you say? <laughs> give yeah, me that. Yeah, give me that. So I said, yeah. He goes, all right. He pours it into a cup. He goes, all right. I start drinking it. <laughs> he goes, you like it? I said, 
It's Ali, right? Yeah. He said, yeah. He goes, good. I hate it. You drink it all. Go ahead. I can't stand that store. Oh, oh. You good. You drink it all. You you stay here and you drink this with me. I'll let him think you. I'm drinking it, but you're gonna drink it, all right? <laughs> <laughs> you know. And oh, I was like, funny. oh, well, you know. <laughs> good. You like it? Yeah. Good. But I don't. You you, you drink it, and it, you know and. uh Athletic Greens does taste better than I remember. My memory serves me that it didn't taste that great. But when Muhammad Ali asked you, you said, yeah, it tastes a great champ. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my story. Athletic Greens, hope you appreciate it. Well, listen, Teddy, thanks for doing this. Appreciate your time as always. Guys, please shout out to the Athletic Greens, one of our um, best sponsors, favorite sponsor, one of my favorite products. Check it out, athleticgreens.com slash atlas. I incorrectly said promo code atlas. It's athleticgreens.com slash atlas to take advantage of the uh, free travel packs. And again, check out Teddy's book on audible.com. Teddy, thanks for doing this. Always fun with you.